October 8th, an Andorra Circle meeting at 10.30 a.m. October 9th, uh, they'll be filling fuel bags at 10 a.m. October the 11th will be a night circle meeting at 6.30 p.m. And then coming up, we have October 13th, we'll be doing handbell choir practice during the Sunday school hour from 9 to 9.45. So if you're interested in joining us, come on out. October 14th, the office will be closed for Indigenous Peoples Day. October 17th, we'll have bingo at 10.30 a.m. And October 18th, we'll have family game night at 6 p.m. October 27th will be trunk or treat from 2.30 to 4. So um, on that note, we're also collecting uh, wrapped candy for the trunk or treat event. If you can't make it out, bring a, bring a bag of the pre-wrapped candy. And then there will also be the charge conference at 4 p.m. on October 27th. So after the trunk or treat, we'll have our charge conference. And then uh, on Sunday, October 13th, we'll be discussing Conversation 7 in our Upward Study Guide. And Anne's Closet has the following needs, canned corn and cans of soup. Your gifts are always humbly received, and we are ever appreciative of your support. As always... Uh, please fill out the attendance pad at the end of your pew to let us know you were with us in worship this morning. Good morning. Good morning. 
It is a joy to be in worship with you this morning. One additional announcement is that Bible study is going to be taking a short hiatus. Um, we are going to work on finding a different time other than Wednesday nights for us to gather and meet. Um, and so I will keep you posted as to when Bible study will be happening. Most importantly, whether this is your first time or you have been attending for years, whether you're strong in your faith or you still have some questions, no matter your age, your tax bracket, your ability, or the color of your skin, no matter who you love or who loves you, you are welcome here. I invite you now to join me in our call to worship. If we wander from love's way out of fear, or in pursuit of power, God, we Jesus us. if we are turned away from the places we once called home, God, God, Jesus. if we desire to create places of belonging that are just and restorative, God, if we go looking for what has been missing within us, God, Praise be to God who leads us on paths of restoration. I invite you now to stand as you are able as we sing together hymn number 548, In Christ There Is No East or West. I will note that you might have noticed that our piano is empty. Margaret is currently in Kansas visiting her family. And so as per usual when we are singing with the recordings, we're going to do our best, and we know that God is with us, and we are making a joyful noise. Please stand as you're able. standing as we affirm our faith. The affirmation of faith can be found in your bulletin and on the screens. Let us affirm our faith together. We believe in a nourishing God who provided manna in the wilderness and water from the rock. We believe in a with us God, Jesus of Nazareth, who set tables for the lonely and ate with the forgotten. We believe in an expansive God, the wild Holy Spirit, meeting us in ritual, regardless of where we gather. Trusting that good news, we come to the table. We pull up extra seats. We learn each other's names. We bless the food. We tell the story. We remember Christ's love. And we look for God in all of it. We believe. Help our unbelief.
be seated. Let us pray together once more the Wesley Covenant Prayer. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee, or laid aside by thee. Exalted for thee, or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine, and I am thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. You may remain seated as we sing together, O God of Every Nation, hymn number 435. stand as you are able for a reading from the Gospel of St. Luke. Luke chapter 15 verses 1 through 10. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, 
Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The words of God for the people of God. You may be seated. This morning we continue our journey through our book. And today we are talking about the dignity of redemption. And it starts with us knowing that something isn't right. We have been created in the image of God. The image of God is stamped on our very being. But brokenness and alienization, alienation characterize our life with God and with others. But God's provision for us in this mess reveals the liberation of redemption. Redemption is liberation. By the nature of the redemption focus, Wesleyan theology is indeed liberation theology. The theology of liberation was developed, the language of it was developed in the 1960s to argue for the liberation of various groups, primarily poor black women, from economic and political bondage. For these Liberation theologians, it is not enough to support the oppressed. One must be committed to social movements, even revolutions, dedicated to overturning the structures of society. Following the Second Vatican Council, leaders from the Catholic Church in Latin America wrote, the option for the poor is simply the idea that, as reflected in canon law, the Christian faithful are so obliged to promote social justice and mindful of the precept of the Lord to assist the poor. It indicates an obligation on the part of those who would call themselves Christian, first and foremost, to care for the poor and vulnerable. So as we think about liberation theology, we move to the overarching realities that are associated with liberation. There are two critical aspects. The redeeming love of God and the redeeming grace of God. And these two aspects, this love and grace, provides us with the foundation that the Wesleys have built their entire theology upon. And so, love is God's nature. And because God loves us, we are to share that love with the world. And this love is not simply an idea or a feeling. It's a verb, an action. This love acts for redemption. This love acts for liberation. This love restores relationships, and it restores us to the image of God. Love draws people to Christ. In her book, The Theology of Love, Mildred Bangs Wincoop wrote that, quote, the ultimate meaning of redemption is the restoration of fellowship 
with God. And this is only accomplished through grace. Because grace is the way in which we enact God's love in the world. And as United Methodists, we love to talk about grace. We love it so much, we have five different types that are outlined in our book. When I was in seminary just five years ago, there were only three. We love to talk about grace. And we affirm that God's grace is present in our own lives in many, many, many different ways. To use the ones from the book, we have preventing, converting, justifying, sanctifying, and glorifying grace. Wesley, John Wesley uses a metaphor of a house to explain the flow of grace. Repentance is the porch. Faith is the door. Holiness is the interior of the house itself. Which brings us to preventing grace, or prevenient grace. The Wesleys believe that God reaches out to us in love before we even have any awareness of God, of God's presence, of God's action. Grace envelops us, surrounds us, but not only just us, but all of creation. Grace comes before anything else. It is God reaching out to us in love. And provenient grace is always with us. And the Wesleys believed it restored the imago Dei, the image of God within us that was lost in the fall. When Eve regrettably ate that apple, or whatever fruit you would like to insert. But we can be restored. And it's this grace that makes it possible to recognize and respond to God's love and grace. It is the grace that invites us onto the porch. In his sermon, The Way of the Kingdom, John Wesley writes, Repent, that is, know yourselves. This is the first repentance, previous to faith, even conviction or self-knowledge. Awake then, you who are sleeping. The eyes of your understanding are darkened, so that they cannot discern God or the things of God. The clouds of ignorance and error rest upon you and cover you with the shadow of death. You know nothing yet as you ought to know, neither God nor the world nor yourself. Your will is no longer the will of God. There is no soundness in your soul. Converting grace is the grace that invites us into Repentance. Repentance. It's the first step in our conversion and therefore in our salvation. Repentance is the step turning back to God. And for the Wesleys, salvation is related both to Christ's redemptive work for us and the Holy Spirit's transforming work in us. It revolves around freedom from sin and freedom to love. And so repentance, this converting grace that invites us to do things differently, 
is like the threshold of the door. It opens the way for us to our spiritual healing. It is inviting us to take the first step on the journey that will lead us home. But this feels like an impossible task to do on our own, which is why we have so many different types of grace because we don't believe that we are doing this on our own. Through justifying grace, God is doing what we can never hope to accomplish on our own. It is through the work of grace that we are transformed both inward and outward. And this outward transformation is what we call justification, in which God declares our righteousness in Christ. And as this outward transformation is happening, simultaneously and inwardly, God is transforming our hearts and souls. <clears throat> as this inward change begins, we move through the door towards the interior of the house. And now we're sanctified. All the way, right? Trick question. No. Sanctification is a process that we are on for ever. This is what Rest Wesley referred to as sanctification begun. Through this, we are invited into theosis. Theosis refers to us participating in the life of God. It is this idea that is the basis for the Wesleyan belief of Christian perfection, that through God's grace we will be so transformed in this life that we will cease from outward sin. It is the affirmation of the expansiveness of grace to transform us. It is this idea that one day we will continue, as we continue, to turn our hearts to Christ. Grace continuously transforms us. And finally, we get to glorifying grace. And I will admit, I know less about this one because it was not in my Wesleyan theology class. I'm going to write Rex Matthews, a very strongly worded email. But Wesley said, we fix the eye of our mind more and more steadfastly on his glory displayed in the gospel. This glorifying grace is what continues to turn us back to Christ. To turn us back to the work and the life and the love of Christ. The movement from earth to heaven is a trajectory that has begun through sanctifying grace and continued through glorifying grace. Life in time is part of life in eternity and this trajectory this trajectory of the way of salvation is begun before we die, before we leave our earthly life, leading us into its glorious consummation when we feast at Christ's heavenly banquet. And all of this grace is great. All of the many different types that are not confusing at all and we all have a perfect grasp on after my wonderful explanations. Grace is great and ever-present and moving in our lives. <clears throat> but I find myself asking the question, where do we go from here? 
where do we go with this knowledge and definitions and what are we supposed to do with it? The Wesleys affirm a theology of participation. We are active participants in the work of God in the world. We are actively participating in the life of God's love and grace. And so where do we go from here? We go into action. God's grace, in order to be fully realized, requires a response. And the Wesleys go into awakening and attachment and commitment and congruence, and it is in the book. I invite you to read it. But basically, we are on this journey to be more like Christ each and every day. Eugene Peterson describes this journey as a long obedience in the same direction. The root of who we are in God's grace is beloved and holy and good. And we are invited to share that with the world by recognizing one another's belovedness. Recognizing that we are all on this crazy, difficult, complex, joyful journey. And part of receiving grace is coming together at the table. And today is World Communion Sunday. It is a Sunday where across the world, Christians all over are joining together at Christ's table. Being reminded of the grace that they have received. And so when we come to the table and experience the grace, we confess our sins together. We confess the places where we have fallen short. And we are offered forgiveness. No matter what we have done this past week or month or go back as far as you would like, no matter what, at this table, Christ welcomes you. Christ invites you. Exactly as you are with all that you are. Because at this table, we are reminded of Christ's unending love and grace for us. This morning, I close with a poem by Reverend Sarah Speed. I wonder if we will know when restoration comes. Will it feel big and dramatic like a summer rain? Joyful and overwhelming like an end of war parade? Maybe. Or will it be small? Will it be pocket-sized moments? Like wishing on stars, the sun through the curtains, or lightning bugs in the yard? Maybe. I don't know how God will restore this world. Just like I don't know how to make the summer rain, but I do know how to say I'm sorry. And I do know how to love with all of me. And I do know how to say this cup is for you. And I know how to taste grace and grape juice. 
So on the off chance that restoration will be small, pocket-sized moments of love for all, I will bake bread and save a seat for you. I will say I'm sorry and say I love you too. I will plant gardens and look for fireflies. I will say prayers on shooting stars at night. And when the sun shines through my curtain windows, remind me to open them wide. I would hate to miss God's parade these holy, ordinary days. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we come to our time of offering this morning, I invite our ushers forward. Let us pray. O oh God, pour out your spirit upon these, our gifts gifts that have been graciously given to you that we now humbly return. Bless these gifts and those who have given them, that they may be used to further your kingdom on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. As we come to our time of prayer this morning, our full prayer list can be found on the back of the bulletin. We want to lift up especially Lucille Thompson, who is in Tonova right now. They are working on getting her blood pressure under control, but don't worry, she is honorary as ever. So we want, but we want to keep her in our prayers. Are there other joys and concerns this morning? We want to lift up Patsy's sister, Charlene Harvey, who is in the hospital here at Tonova. <coughs> we wish a very special happy birthday to Andrew, whose birthday was yesterday. We also wish a very special birthday to Sue Goodrich, who is not here today, but her birthday is tomorrow. And so... Happy birthday to both of them and all who have October birthdays and all whose birthdays we might not have wished a happy birthday to from the pulpit. Nina? Uh, speaking of birthdays, today is Beth and Satan's birthday and tomorrow will be my little Annie Cat's 19th birthday. <laughs> today is also Beth McSpaden's birthday and tomorrow 
is Addie's 19th birthday. Addie is not the one sitting up here, but one of Vita's cats. <laughs> so, again, very special happy birthdays all around. Are there any others? Let us go to God in prayer. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks for this day. Thanks for the sunshine. Thanks for another opportunity to gather together. To gather and celebrate the lives in which we live with one another. To celebrate more birthdays than we can ever count. To celebrate the joyous, ordinary moments that we share together. Oh God, we also come to you praying for those who are in need of your healing mercy. We ask that you surround them in your steadfast love and remind them that they are never alone. Oh God, remind us that we are never alone. On this World Communion Sunday, oh God, we pray for the nations that are in conflict. We pray for those who have been injured and killed in war. Oh God, we ask that your justice and peace might flow down like a river. And we ask that you would make us instruments of your love and peace. Oh God, pour your spirit upon us. We pray these things and all things in your son's holy name. As it is World Communion Sunday, and also First Sunday, we will be celebrating Holy Communion. This table is not my table. It is not St. Bethlehem's table. It is not the United Methodist Church's table. This is Christ's table. And at Christ's table, all are invited, welcomed, and celebrated. few notes that I'm remembering to tell you. We will be taking communion today by intention, and so you will be invited to come forward. And you'll be given a piece of bread, and you're invited to dip it in the cup and then eat the bread and juice together. If you forget and accidentally eat your bread before you dip, the, dip it in the juice, we'll give you another piece. There's enough body of Christ to go around. There is nuts in the bread we are using today. We do have allergen-free available that is both gluten-free and nut-free. Any money that is left on the altar goes to our Helping Hands Fund, which goes to assist our neighbors in need. Scripture says that people will come from north and south, east and west, to sit at God's table in God's kingdom. 
I must confess there are few images more lovely than that. But until that beautiful promised day, when all creation will share a table with Christ, we will keep gathering at this table. And at this table, we tell the story of God's love. And at this table, we will break bread and drink from the cup. And at this table, none will be turned away, for Jesus welcomes all. At this table, we will dream of a better world where all are fed. And at this table, none will leave hungry. So come, join us in a feast. Join the world in this feast. This is Christ's table. Family of faith, no matter what your week has looked like, no matter what you carry with you into this space, Jesus is always going to invite you to the table. That's the amazing thing about God's love. It does not keep score, and it knows no end. So join me in the prayer of confession, not because you have to, but because you can. Join me in the prayer of confession, trusting that with these words, God is already inviting you into deeper faith. Let us pray. We hear your invitation to love our neighbors as ourselves, to live like we belong together. And yet what is out of sight is often out of mind. Forgive us for training our hearts to focus only on what is in front of us. Forgive us for ignoring the tie that binds us to all creation. Forgive us for assuming that you being with us means you can't be with others too. Our gaze has been too narrow. Open our hearts. Expand our understanding. Help us to celebrate the many places you are present in this world. Remind us of the ties that bind us to all of creation. With hope in our hearts, we pray. Family of faith, I don't know what this past week has looked like for you, but I do know this. There is a seat at God's table saved for you. And that is the case even if you overlooked your neighbor, even if you doubted God's love for you, even if you chose scarcity over abundance or fear over joy. God has saved a seat for you. Trusting this good news, join me in the words of forgiveness. We are known, we are loved, we are forgiven, we begin again. Thanks be to God for a love like that. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. In the beginning, you created us from dust. You called us to live in your image and to be of one mind. Even when we grumbled and complained, and we argued and fought, you called us to unity and love. Even when we neglected your teachings and turned away from your call, you invited us back into your vineyard of mercy and grace. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. 
Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your beloved name. In the fullness of time you sent Christ Jesus to call us anew to abundant life, compassionate love, and unity with you and your people. With encouragement and grace, Christ calls us now to join in unity with his followers around the world. May we be of one mind, live as one people, and love with the power of your grace. Through this amazing grace, we are invited to your table, welcomed in your love, and reclaimed as siblings in Christ. As children of your mercy and grace, we come with humble hearts and open minds, remembering how Jesus shared a feast of love, and how he invites us even now to share this feast of love with one another. On the night before his death, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your life-giving acts of love and grace, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as children of your love, in union with Christ's love for us and our love for one another as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. God of manna and mustard seeds, we are hungry and hopeful. And as we gather at this table, we ask that you would pour out your spirit on this ordinary bread and cup. Transform this simple feast into a reminder of what could be in the world where all are fed, all are welcomed, and all are known. Until that day, may this bread nourish our bodies alongside our spirits. May the joy of singing and feasting together buoy our weary hearts. And may your radical welcome open deeper compassion for us and our neighbors. Through Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. With gratitude for your love and a hunger for community, we weave our voices together in prayer, saying together the words Jesus taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Because there is one loaf, we who are many partake in the one loaf. The bread which we break is sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is sharing in the blood of Christ. At this time, I invite those assisting with communion to come forward.
The table is set, and you are invited to come as you feel led. Let us pray. 
Holy God, every time we come to this table, we look for you. We come looking for welcome, looking for reasons to hope. And just as you have promised, you have met us here. What a gift. We may never be the same. So as we prepare to leave this place, may we go with the memories of this holy meal clinging to us. May we remember what it felt like to be welcomed to your table. And may we welcome others with that same warmth. May we remember what it felt like to have a meal where all were fed. And may we work for a world where none are hungry. May we remember what it felt like to draw closer to you. And may we continually seek you out with all that we do. Feeding God week after week, we look for you. Week after week, you meet us here. Thank you. May we never be the same. Amen. As we come to the close of our service this morning, I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing together hymn number 616, Come Sinners to the Gospel Feet. Feast. Unless you also have gospel feet. <laughs> this is our weekly Charles Wesley hymn. different grace there is, but it is a gift that is freely given to us no matter what. May we take that grace into the world. Amen.
Okay, you just gotta get up here and gotta 